Um, and we'll begin with public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone to comment on an item that is within our purview but not on our agenda. We'll take public comments on all the items on our agenda as we go through them. Is there anyone who would like to make a public comment? Seeing none, the, uh, move on to item C, which is the approval of the minutes. Is there a, any comments on the minutes or a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Butt to approve the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The next item is the consent calendar. This is a series of items that we will act on in one motion unless any member of the public, a member of staff, or a member of the committee wishes to remove an item. Is there a request by anyone to remove an item from the consent calendar? Yes. Commissioner Arnerich. Yeah, I had um, two items, just a quick questions on. It's on item 4.1. Stantec, um, and also on, I apologize, my highlighter wasn't working. Um, so the other one on the management contract, uh, State Route 4, which is? 6-0. Uh, is that 5-0 or 6 It's the one where we're at 20% of the value of the construction contract. Let's do 4.1, and then I'll catch up on the other one. Okay. All right, so there's been a request to remove item 4.1 and a draft choice yet to be named. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do you proceed? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Just talk on 4.1 for a second. Just okay. My question is on 4.1. All right, well, why don't we take 4.1 before we adopt the rest of the consent calendar? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, is um, just the explanation. There's a, um, a note in there that... It exceeds 20% annual increase cost. Didn't exactly have a strong, compelling reason why. I mean, this is our largest contract we issue for consulting. And it says that there is, um, however, it doesn't meet the standard, but there's, it's justified. It says the annual average cost for these services exceeds the annual average cost for post services by approximately 20%. Justification includes. I just kind of wanted to know what. I mean, this is a new contract. Um, we're starting out on this path and just. Yeah, Ross isn't here. He's sick. And he wrote this agenda item. I think what it is, it's unanticipated expansion due to the increased role of ITS. I don't think it has anything to oh. do with. Okay, because it didn't things. exactly say that. But okay. Yeah, so it's, it's hard to anticipate how much staff time is going to be needed for a lot of these research projects that are coming our way. Okay. That makes sense. That's much clearer. Okay. okay. Um, and the second one is it's our consulting contract um, for project management services, State Route 4. Project values of 35 million, and our project management the change order here gets us up to seven million dollars. Um, um, which number is that? And it includes some design. I, I'm not sure if it includes this. Yeah, the change order is. Well, the total value gets us up to. Uh, you sure that wasn't item 17.1, Commissioner Arnarch, which has a 35 million and a seven million yes, amount thank you. in it. Thank you. Okay, we'll okay. get to that. I, I, normally, all right. all <laughs> my highlight is that Okay. One. Yeah. All right. Okay, I would move the consent calendar. Yes. That's the second. The motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Arnridge to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Which now brings us to item 13, which is our legislative update. Ms. Wills. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I think that the uh, federal update in your packet does a pretty good job of explaining where we are, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on that. Um, there's been a short-term extension of MAP 21 through July 31st, which just happens to be right before Congress is scheduled to go on recess in August. So um, also it's the same time that the Highway Trust Fund is scheduled to run out of money. So I think it will be a really critical time later this summer 
in terms of um, finding a solution to that problem. Um, the conversation about any sort of multi-year bill is still centered around tax reform, um, but at this point, both sides of the aisles continue to claim that the other side refuses to work with them to come up with a solution that everyone can agree upon. So um, I feel like I've been giving the same report every month to you that not much progress has been made, and here we are again, and not much progress has been made. Um, hopefully something will change over the course of the summer and I'll have good news to report to you. Um, but in the meantime, it's uh, more, more of the same and we continue to, to watch and wait and see how this will play out in the long run. Um, so hopefully um, our state advocate, Mark Watt, has a, has a little bit of a brighter report for you than I do this morning on what's happening at, at the state level. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, or I can turn it directly over to Mark, and we can take any questions at the end. Federal, okay. There you go, Mark, please. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. Um, things are starting to come together on the state budget in Sacramento. This is uh, the day that the conference committee will be considering transportation items, so I'll be anxious to get back up to Sacramento, um, and I'll explain uh, an action we're pushing as I get into one of the bills. Um, typically, uh, typically, there's a lot of issues at play in the budget for transportation this year. There's a lot of consensus, a uh, mod modest number of differences. Uh, probably the next key interest point for the budget for agencies will be the cap and trade program, which will probably come up in the next day or so. Uh, there, the assembly has added about 80, $180 million in a, in a slate of programs uh, to, that may affect uh, regional agencies and MPOs, and the uh, Senate has added $500 million, so there'll be a lot of discussions and reconciliation between those items. But it's going pretty smoothly, and I'll keep uh, staff advised as, as we progress on the budget. In terms of legislation, um, we have several bills that we were recommending positions uh, for your consideration today. I thought I'd cover them briefly and be available to answer questions if you have them. Uh, we did speak uh, previously about Mr. Levine's AB 157. This is the measure that would uh, ask the department and MTC to um, uh, accelerate design along with environmental process for the uh, third lane eastbound and the bike lane westbound on the Richmond Bridge. Um, it seems to be uh, moving in that direction anyway between the uh, state and MTC, but this bill would codify that legislative intent that the environmental documentation be done at the same time as the uh, design work proceeds. So we've recommended a support position. That was which item? Page four. Page four, okay. Yeah, 13.7, 13, 13, page 4 is the list of recommended positions. Okay. Then did you want to, you want to, why don't you come cover them all and then we can, right. At your pleasure, I'll proceed through them all and then we can uh, discuss them. The second measure is AB 194 by Mr. Frazier. This is the uh, uh, tolling policy for the state. Um, there had been some controversy earlier when the administration proposed their own tolling, administra uh, tolling uh, approach to be considered as a budget trailer bill. Both houses said, no, we want to see a policy bill. This is that policy bill that I think will um, uh, be the, uh, the bill at the end of the day. Uh, essentially, it authorizes Caltrans and the transportation agencies, uh, uh, regional transportation agencies of the state to engage in tolling hot lanes and managed lanes. Uh, importantly, this bill has a provision that allows uh, or requires the MPO or the Regional Transportation Agency to consult with local transportation agencies, very, very carefully drafted uh, by the uh, author staff to ensure that there's a collaboration. Uh, it also authorizes an agreement between the Regional Transportation Agency and the local transportation agency and in fact, they've expanded the definition to include CMA specifically, so that it's very clear that MTC is to consult with this agency and others in the Bay Area um, and to offer the uh, ability to have an agreement to, for you to undertake um, any uh, design, pre-engineering, pre-, -engineering, pre uh, and environmental work uh, with respect to a segment in your jurisdiction. Um, 
that bill is now in the Senate. Uh, hasn't been has been assigned to Transportation and Housing Committee, but has not been set for hearing yet. Um, the next measure is AB 464 by Mr. Mullen. This is the measure we're recommending support for that lifts the countywide cap from 2% to 3% for local sales taxes. Um, this would uh, obviate the need to come to Sacramento on a case-by-case -case basis by, by counties to address this issue. Uh, and this bill is uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate as well. Uh, ACA 4 is the constitutional amendment by Assemblymember Frazier that would uh, address the voter threshold for local special taxes for transportation purposes. Um, the bill has moved to the Senate. Uh, we're recommending support. Uh, the only um, cloud on the horizon for this measure at this point in time is uh, a number of business organizations are concerned about the use of the phrase special tax as opposed to uh, sales tax, because uh, special taxes could be viewed broader and might sweep in parcel taxes. So there's discussions going on whether to thin that down back to sales taxes only or leave it broader and undertake the opposition of the tax agencies or tax organizations. The last bill is uh, SB 321. We spoke about this before. Uh, your committee, I believe, recommended a support position, we are reaffirming that because it did, was not acted upon by the board. But I do have a little bit of uh, an update. Uh, one of the things I'll be doing when I go back to Sacramento is working with a small group of folks. We're trying to put that bill in as a budget trailer bill. The bill, as you may recall, is the measure that would uh, adjust the process that the Board of Equalization uses to estimate the annual price-based excise tax increment. This was a, a vestige of the sales tax swap from several years ago. Uh, it is estimated to, if, if this were enacted in time, to result in a savings, a reduced reduction, if you will, um, that the Board of Equalization would be able to adopt that would, re, that would reduce the impact and uh, save uh, STIP, SHOP, AND LOCAL ROADS, $500 MILLION OVER THE COURSE OF 2015-16. Um, AND THAT'S WHY WE'RE TRYING TO PUT IT INTO THE BUDGET ACT SO IT BECOMES EFFECTIVE IMMEDIATELY. EVERY MONTH THAT'S DELAYED COSTS ABOUT $80 MILLION IN THE NET SAVINGS TO THOSE PROGRAMS. SO I'M HOPEFUL WE'LL BE ABLE TO DO THAT AND um, ENCOURAGE YOUR CONTINUED SUPPORT OF THAT MEASURE. SO THOSE ARE THE f MEASURES THAT WE HAD TO MAKE RECOMMENDATIONS TO YOU TODAY. Are there questions? Commissioner Pierce? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. On the Fraser Bill, ACA 4, um, is the language special tax in there to allow for, say, parcel tax for BART? It's not clear why they put special tax. I think it was uh, kind of a carryover from the last two years' worth of uh, efforts to okay. reduce the threshold. So I just not, wondered if there was a specific something coming up that somebody somewhere has that... Um, I'm unaware of, of, of any special efforts. Okay, because I thought he was trying to keep this pretty closely targeted so that it wasn't becoming the voluminous bill that we've, mm -hmm. we've seen in the past. Okay. okay. Um, I'll be interested to hear if you find anything different on that. Um, and just a clarification on uh, SB 321, the, the tax swap saves money for SHOP and Caltrans and STIP versus the general fund, which is where the money is going now. Is that no, right? No, no. Well, uh, it, the tax swap, yes. This is a discrete separate transportation o uh, impact only But measure. if we don't do this, where does the money go? It evaporates. It, it, the it board doesn't of, evaporate. Somebody gets it. No, no, no. It, because what, what, the, what the obligation of the Board of Equalization is to set the annual tax rate. Uh huh. And they were proposing a tax rate reduction based on their estimating skills. I remember that now. Thank you. Thank you. That was the one we all You're right. It about. does not evaporate. The citizens get to keep it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, what a logical thing to do. No, I understand now. I remember. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions or comments about any of the items? Okay. I, I had one on 464. I understood that at one point the League of California Cities was taking a position of preferring a 2.5% cap. Do you know where the league stands now? 
It is at three. I have not heard if he's willing to reduce it. Okay. I think that the only reason the league was doing that, from our understanding, is is that they felt that the three might not pass. So. Okay. Where, where, where does it stand in terms of progressing through the? It's process? it's in the second house and hasn't been heard yet. Okay. All right. Uh, any any public comment on any of these items? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. A motion by Taylor, second by Pierce to adopt the recommendations. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. I had one last oh, item to, to, to raise for your attention in discussions with staff uh, uh, here at, at the uh, agency. Um, a quickly emerging issue uh, regarding the road charge technical advisory committee process that's underway um, by the State Transportation Commission pursuant to Senator Desani's bill from last year. Um, just as backdrop, the TAC is responsible to develop a pilot program concept, hand it to the Cal California State Transportation Agency, and they would undertake a pilot program in 2018. Efforts are underway to accelerate that, and consequently the meeting schedules and the decision-making schedule is being accelerated. That resulted in a request in the last two weeks from a number of stakeholders, including the Self-Help County Coalition, on some decisions that were scheduled to be made with regard to the framework for the pilot program. And that meeting was conducted in Fresno on Friday. The issue at hand was, in, in this particular instance, is what vehicles should be subject to the pilot program. All vehicles, some subset of vehicles, uh, and remember, this is for the pilot program, not for the eventual uh, program itself. Uh, the Self-Help County Coalition um, Executive Director, in consultation with his board, acted quickly and swiftly and endorsed a position saying all vehicles should be in. They cited the issue of EVs should not be uh, allowed out in their letter. So the issue that we want to bring to you is, is do you have a policy direction that we should follow as we as we monitor the rest of this progress on the uh, pilot program development. As an update, after the meeting on, at the meeting on Friday, later that day, they did adopt an all vehicles scheme. Uh, they have eight categories of vehicles, and all vehicles did include alternative fuel and electric vehicles. So that gives you a little bit of perspective. Um, and, but we felt it would be important as we move forward. In case there's a reconsideration or an adjustment later, is there some direction you'd like to uh, provide to us? So I'll just, as, as an owner of an EV, I'm going to abstain on this item, so I'm going to turn the discussion over to the <laughs> vice chair. <laughs> He's asking you to run the meeting. Right. So do what? He's asking you to run the meeting. I, I, have, an I have an electric vehicle, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to abstain and oh, let you run this okay. discussion. So it's, it's just the discussion of um, whether we would support including EVs in a essentially for all or all vehicles, or, right? For all vehicles, or to take a different view with regards to certain types of vehicles. Okay, I'll support you. Well, I actually think all vehicles should be included. Um, Oregon actually started theirs mostly with electric vehicles. Part of the reason they're doing all vehicles is because they all use the road. There is wear and tear from all vehicles that are on the road. And electric vehicles pay no gas tax. So how do we pay for their use of the road other than the GHG savings? So I think it ought to be all vehicles. It's a pilot program. If we don't test the it, in the pilot program, how will we have answers? Yeah, I, I agree with Julie. I think we have to do all um, all vehicles, just to be fair. And the, the reason for the exemption originally was clear for set asides, um, HO fee free passes was to encourage people to use that. You know what? That it's, it is the future. We're here. Um, the, the only caution is is that. Um, you know, for those of us who feel you can afford to pay those things, there's a lot of people that commute that have no alternative. And when you, I, I recently saw the study for those who are riding our CC, CCTA system. Um, their average 
earnings was under $14,000 a year. So you have a lot of people that commute. They gather people together. They get in that car. They're living in a place they can afford to go to a job to pay them a little bit. Um, we're going to penalize those people. And, and, you know, in philosophy, we're hurting those who really can't afford to drive. They barely can drive. So, you know, you can say, well, they're using the road, and that's just the way it is. But there's, there's an unintended consequence that those um, um, who are driving who can barely afford to make it and there's no alternative transportation, it's really going to hurt those people. So what's your alternative? Well, here's, let, me, let me add a piece of information here. The Oregon program is in lieu of gas tax. You pay a mileage charge. And when you do the calculation based on what Oregon is doing, it comes out almost exactly the same um, based on mileage. So it's one or the other, not both. That that's one alternative. There may be others that the the ruck is is looking at. This is after collecting it, more money. This isn't after making it balanced and equitable. This is a way to capture more money. Period. Equity would be interesting, but that's not the point. Well, well what what Oregon is doing is actually making it equitable in that those who put the miles on the roads are the ones paying for it, and those who don't don't. So that's the way Oregon's doing it. I don't know exactly where the ruck is going. Maybe maybe um, we can get more information on that, but for at least for the pilot, I think we need to look at all of it and, and look at that. And, and my preference would be that we find something that is equitable so that those who are actually using the roads are the ones paying <laughs> for the roads. And if folks are in BART instead of driving to the city, then they don't pay those miles. And so. I just, if I might add, the, the, one of the challenges for the TAC is to look at evaluation criteria, and some of the criteria will address these issues. So the pilot program will be a true pilot. They will look at spatial distribution, geographic distribution impacts, socioeconomic impacts, uh, before they make a recommendation for the pilot program to be um, uh, initiated. Anybody else got an opinion? Mm -hmm. So do we need to uh, do we need to express an opinion, or are we just uh, yeah, we discussing it? it? So um, I would I, move it includes all vehicles. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. All vehicles. Thank you, and that completes my report. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck this Aye. month. <laughs> All right, this brings us to item 14, which is the proposed budget for the Transportation Authority and the Congestion Management Agency. Um, Brian, welcome. Good morning, Chair, Chair Tatson and committee members. As we were just here last month, um, I'm just presenting the budget to you again. And I can go over just the two changes that we have made since that time. But to let you know that as last month we went through and looked at paying off our unfunded liability, um, that was one of the changes that we added to the proposed budget for fiscal year 2016. Um, just by reducing the pension costs by 6.2%, we've saved about $165,000 on the salaries. Um, the other change that we made is we added an additional $3 million in STIP funding to the I-80 project, and that was based on a timing of the project and using STIP funding versus Measure J funding for part of the project. Um, those are the two only changes that we have. Um, I also did want to point out in the budget, um, it was recommended that we point out that we have a bonus program in there that was established in 2013, um, and that will be again presented as a separate board item that's at the discretion of the executive director and the board members to approve in December. Um, with that, I'm here to answer any questions that you have on the budget or take any considerations. Are there questions on the budget? Commissioner Arnerich. Yeah, just to clarify on the last item you mentioned, isn't that a pay for performance as opposed to what yes. you call a bonus? Pay for performance. Yeah, I, I, I would use that term because I think that's different. 
yeah, very different um, um, way. Thank um, you very much. Putting in context because we're, you know, the executive director is looking at somebody, you achieve your goals, and this is an incentive program. So. It's a motion by Commissioner Arnold, second by Commissioner Button. Before we vote, I would just like to thank you, Brian and, and Randy. It was, it was a great job. I went through the budget again yesterday. It takes me several passes to sort of begin to understand it more. And it was very well laid out. I mean, you could see how things were going to, you know, were put together. So I just really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, uh, APC Chair Tatson. Um, you know, Brian really has put, a, you know, all the effort into this. And it's uh, uh, a team effort as well uh, with uh, other department heads and uh, individuals involved in pulling the information together. Uh, in regards to what we'll do at the board level, we will present, you know, the budget uh, in more detail and give them uh, a high-level overview uh, when we seek their, their approval. Okay, great. Thank you. So there's, so there's a motion by Arnold, second by Butt. Um, I think. <laughs> um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thanks again. Which brings us to item 15, which is an approval of the authority's investment policy for the upcoming fiscal year. Mr. Carlton. Yeah, that would be me. Uh, my name is Randy Carlton. I'm the CFO for the authority. Uh, there are two parts to this item. One is uh, informational. It's a portfolio update on our investments. Um, you know, like uh, all public agencies, we have idle cash. Um, and let me uh, just take a moment and define what that means. Um, it's not that it's money that is uh, – uh, unaccounted for or, or unencumbered or not planned for specific use. It's just the, the simple analogy of, you know, just because we receive a dollar today doesn't mean we need to spend it today. And while we, while those cash dollars are idle, what we do is we invest them and earn uh, as much interest as we reasonably can within the framework of an investment policy that uh, this board approves. Uh, state law um, has uh, an investment policy. It calls for public agencies to have an investment policy. Ours mirrors state law for the most part. Um, where it's different, uh, our policy is slightly more restrictive. Um, there are one, one element of the investment policy is the type of investments that we can invest in, uh, and, that, and there's some uh, description on the t uh, kind of investments we cannot uh, invest in. Um, you know, this is a, a bit of an evolving uh, uh, environment uh, where the types of investments will change. Uh, some uh, become more attractive than others. Um, things happen at the federal level, such as uh, what we've seen with um, the, the shutdown of some federal agencies like the Federal National Mortgage Association. And the, the type of debt that we commonly would be buying from them is no longer available. Uh, so what has happened is um, uh, at, at the state level, state has approved uh, an additional type of investment that, uh, as a part of Carlos's uh, presentation towards end, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about because it is a change. It is a change uh, to our investment policy, um, and, and the term you'll hear is supranational uh, securities. And uh, I won't uh, steal any of, of Carlos's thunder there. But uh, the first part is. Uh, um, an overview of, of our investment policy, or excuse me, our investment portfolio. We have $217 million of cash. Um, and what uh, Carlos and his firm, uh, PFM Asset Management, what they do is they, they manage about $100 million of that. And, and, and the other $117 million approximately um, is, is either, you know, liquid cash that we need to pay for our bills um, or, you know, about 65 million of it is bond proceeds from the 2012 transaction. We have some money invested with a state fund called LAFE, which is common to, to most public agencies in their selection of investments. Um, but, uh, you know, we really do try and focus on providing safety uh, for the cash, um, having it ready when we need it, and uh, in the meantime, uh, earning a reasonable rate of uh, return. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Carlos Oblitez from PFM Asset Management. Um, he has a few slides to go over, and we'll be, uh, we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. We could be through the chair. Commissioner uh, uh, Taylor. Uh, Rand, could be hold on a minute. Is that right? Uh, through, is there a, a, a cap on how much cash that we can have? And then is there a cap on 
how long we can have it? Um, there's no, um, to answer your question, there's no overall cap of how much cash we can have uh, as an agency. There are certain limits on the amount of cash we can invest in those different investment types, uh, which is guided by the investment policy, um, you know, like 30 percent uh, cap on the amount that we can invest in um, federal agency securities or, or, or you know, 80 percent cap on uh, U.S. Treasuries. We have those type of caps. And then some of the issuers, like the state, um, their local agency investment fund, they have a cap per agency of $50 million, I believe. Uh, the second question, uh, I'm sorry, re remind me. Oh, well, oh, how long? Yes. Some of those things are also um, uh, dictated by, by uh, state law. Uh, we have uh, a five-year maximum um, maturity length in, in our investments. You know, we, can, we can buy an investment uh, up to uh, five years. That's beyond our uh, reasonable um, term that we'd be purchasing uh, because we are we are far shorter than than that because we have liquidity needs, but state law does prohibit anything longer than five years. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Can you hear me now? Thank you very much. Well, as Randy stated, I'd like to bring you up to date uh, very briefly on what's happening in the portfolio. And then I'd like to discuss some of the changes that we've seen in California government code, which we'd like you to consider for your investment policy statement. Um, if you turn directly to page number two in your presentation, I'd like you to focus on the chart on the left-hand side, which is uh, the yield on two-year treasuries and how that yield has fared for the past 12 months as of March 31st. And I'd like to make two observations on that chart. They are that, number one, yields are higher than a year ago in this range of, of maturities. And that is certainly the case for maturities at two years and shorter. They're certainly higher than they were a year ago. The other observation I'd like to make is that that yield has been very volatile. And what has driven that has been expectations from investors waiting for the Federal Reserve to finally raise short-term interest rates. It's mixed and it's volatile because we've had mixed economic news come out and investors place their money or, or, or make investments based upon what they think the Fed might do, and that might change literally from day to day. I'd like you to note the chart on the right-hand side. That's the historical yield for 10-year treasuries, longer investments. You don't invest out there, but we look at these because they can give us an indication of where the broader economy is going. And generally, when investors are expecting the Federal Reserve to raise the short-term rate and two-year investments are moving up in yield, longer investments will move even higher. But that hasn't been the case. Up until this morning, it hasn't been the case. Yields in that range have actually come down dramatically. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, we are still in a very low inflation environment. Uh, our growth has not been what we've expected it to be. And an additional factor, an external factor, is that investors from abroad, particularly from Europe, believe it or not, can today get a higher yield buying a 10-year treasury in the United States than they can get by buying a 10-year German bond in Europe. And if you turn to the next page, you can actually see that. The orange line is that 10-year yield that you just looked at going back 10 years. The other, the other lines, the light blue is... Uh, is, is Spain, the gray is Italy, the dark blue is Germany. I want you to look at German bonds. As of quarter end, an investor locking their money up in German bonds for 10 years was getting paid approximately one quarter of 1% per year for 10 years. That's a very low yield. The reasons for that are many. Mainly, the European Central Bank, seeing that there's been a bit of a recession in the European economy, has been... Uh, lowering interest rates by doing quantitative easing. We've talked about that in the past. It's just that uh, the purchasing of securities to artificially drive that rate down, it's something that the, that, that the United States, we did here about three, four years ago. But it's, it's played an interesting dynamic, one of them which factors back to our economy. It's weakened their currency, making our currency stronger and driving our exports down, and that's one of the reasons why our economy has been sideways. 
But back to your portfolio, in that shorter range on page number number four, looking at the yield curve, just the I'm charting here the yield of Treasury securities from three months out to five years, and I go no longer than five years because, as Randy stated, you, you don't invest beyond five years. But you can see that quarter over quarter, even though certainly in the two-year range, yields are higher than from a year ago, over the last three months they fell. And that created a rally in the bond markets. It just basically means this. While re yields were rising, we were capturing higher yields for the portfolio which helped the income component of your return. And when yields fell, those income, th those bonds that provide you income appreciated in value. So you're going to see that. I'm going to, I'm going to show you some figures to that effect. Um, one of the things, since yields are now rising, I'm looking at page number five. Because yields are rising, the way to drive return in this environment has been more yield driven. And that's one of the things that we're working to do in this portfolio. And one of the things that we've noticed is that the yield differential between treasury securities, the safer investment, and yield advantage sectors, those sectors that carry a higher yield than treasury, such as federal agencies, corporate securities, uh, negotiable certificates of deposit, they carry a substantially higher yield in those treasuries. And we've found value in those sectors. And you can see on page number five that over the last three months, we've actually decreased our treasury holdings and moved into yield advantage sectors. Normally, U.S. treasuries, which are as of March, 51% uh, of the portfolio, I could look back at this portfolio three, two years ago, and this would have been in the 20% range. Until recently, uh, the difference between treasuries and federal agencies such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the yield difference has been so minimal that we've been buying treasuries. But that reversed a little bit in the last quarter, and that's why you see these shifts. So what does that mean for your portfolio? If you look at page number six, it means that the interest income component of your return, meaning that the yield, the maturity, the income you're going to collect for the coming year if nothing, nothing changes that you've locked into, well, that has continually gone higher and higher. In fact, we are about 22 basis points, almost a quarter point higher than we were over the past year, which is a substantial amount higher on a percentage basis given that we've been in rock bottom rates. You can see how that yield has fared relative to your benchmark, the one to three year treasury index. We use that because uh, as Randy stated, we maintain your investments mainly between one and three years to drive the liquidity that you need. And you can see how the yield is certainly higher than the state pool local agency investment fund at the bottom. And when we look at returns, I want you to focus on the past quarter and the past year. So this return is a look back for a period, and it's a very holistic number. It includes the yield that you, that you collected, the interest income that you booked to your budget, and it also includes the market value appreciation. And you can see that for the past year and for the past quarter, those numbers were very strong. And I want to dig in a little bit more because I think this is going to explain the environment that we're going to enter into in the coming year. If you would turn to page number eight very quickly. So you notice that for, for the past quarter, the return was 56 basis points, a little bit over half a percent. Well, if you look at page number eight on the far right-hand side and you look at the bottom row, there's that total return, 56 basis points. So that number for those three months encompasses the two ways that you can generate return in your portfolio, interest income, and it encompasses the change in market value. And what I've done is I've broken out the dollars in that table up top. The top line is that interest income, and then, of course, if we sold anything before maturity, that gain gets factored into there as well. And that is the number that goes to your financial statements and to your budget. The second line is the change of value on paper. And then, of course, the total return is a combination of both of those because we're trying to give you a holistic view of, of, of where you stand, your full position on your bonds. And what I can tell you is that that top line, the in interest income, because yields are continuing to rise, the trend is higher, it means that your interest income for the coming year will be higher than what you had last year. And indeed, I peaked up when Brian was up here presenting the budget, I noticed that he too estimated the, or, or budgeted a higher interest income component on your budget, which, which, is, which goes in tandem with what I'm saying here. As yields rise, you're going to collect higher interest income and you'll benefit from that. Now, when I look at it on a holistic approach, the total return, you can see that the change in market value on paper 
that that may be sideways. There may be some points in time where that may drag down your overall return simply because as rates rise, that number tends to fall. Um, if you look at page number nine, you can see the, the holdings as they stand as a quarter end. Uh, approximately a quarter of the portfolio is in high-grade, medium-term notes. These are corporate notes, very high credit quality. Uh, we do hold one municipal security that we found uh, yielding higher than treasuries, and we like the credit and we purchased it, about 51% in treasuries. And you can see that it's a very high credit quality portfolio. Um, and then in terms of the maturity structure, I mentioned that we do maintain on page number uh, number 10, uh, actually it's listed as number 11 up there, uh, you can see that the maturity structure uh, the bulk of the investments are invested between one and three years. Uh, we do sometimes go just slightly over three years if there is, is uh, an advantage to picking up yield. But for the most part, uh, the, the bulk of the investments are there. Um, let me talk a little bit about the economy. I'm going to be very brief because I'd like to reserve the rest of my time for the, for the policy. But you can see here out of this chart, when we measure the growth of our economy for the past few quarters, we had strong second and third quarter last year. Uh, the, the fourth quarter was weak, and then the first quarter of this year, you can see that initial numbers came in at 0.2%, at which is very, very weak. And indeed, that, re that number last week was revised down to negative 0.7%. Our economy is slowing down. One of the reasons I stated earlier, we're seeing exports slow down. We did see a, a inventory buildup, did not build up like they thought it would, uh, and, and there was a uh, there was an upward revision to imports, which means that we, we're, we're exporting less because the dollar is much more expensive, making our goods more expensive abroad. Um, so the main story that people are looking at are really inflation and unemployment, so I'll touch up on both of those very, very briefly. If you look at the chart on the upper left-hand side of page number 13 before you, that, that is the that, – that's uh, CPI and PCE. They're two different measures of inflation. I'm happy to explain both of them, but I want you to focus on the blue line. That's the personal consumption's expenditure. It's a measure of inflation that the Fed focuses on, and that number is well below 2%. They're looking for inflation to be at 2% for them to start ri raising interest rates. That's what they're looking for, and we're not quite there. W w why are we so low? Well, we said that the economy hasn't picked up like we expected it to be. Business investment hasn't been like we wanted it to be. Consumer spending slowed down just a little bit. But the interesting piece of all of this, of course, is that some of the drivers of inflation, though not counted in this number, certainly factor into the other factors, uh, have been oil. Oil is still very, very low. Uh, we, we experienced a 50, 45, 46 percent drop in oil prices last year. Uh, we experienced another 10, almost 11 percent drop in oil this year. And, and that has certainly driven inflation down. Uh, if you look at the chart on the far right-hand side, this shows you the, 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 the way that currencies have played up. And I just want you to look at the blue currency, the, the blue line. That's how many dollars it takes to buy a euro. Notice that it takes less and less. It just means that the dollar is appreciating. In fact, if you go to the next page, you can see the price drops. Look at the chart in the middle, 2014. There's that oil number, 46% down for the year. And look at the chart on the right-hand side. 10.6% down for the year on, in the gray bar. And there's that euro uh, down to $1.13, down from $1.40. So it, 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 th these, these forces play into our economy and play into the Fed's thinking on when they're going to raise rates or when they're going to lower rates. And, and why does that affect you? It affects you because, again, both to the two ways of generating return, interest income will be higher, and that's good news. But the values on paper may fall, and we monitor both of those on your behalf. I mentioned that unemployment uh, is the other p part of the picture. We're now at 5.5 percent. That dropped down from 5.6. But the number that, that they're really focusing on is job creation. Generally, uh, economists like to see jobs created about at around 200,000 per month. March broke a 12-month streak of 200,000 jobs created per month for the past 12 months. Uh, they dropped down to 126. That was revised downwards later to only 85,000 jobs. April came in a little stronger, but when you balance the two, we're a little bit behind. Why did the unemployment rate fall? If you look at, uh, at the following page on page 16, the chart on the upper left-hand side, we're seeing that this is the labor force participation rate, those people that are eligible to work. We're seeing the number of people eligible to work leave the workforce, which plays with the numbers and drives that percentage rate down. Um, so when we look at unemployment and say it's at 5.5 and it's down from 5.6, it doesn't necessarily tell you the full story. Um, and then it just brings me to my last point before we get to the investment policy statement. Um, 
I went back and I talked about where we think the, the Federal Reserve is headed and when they're going to tighten rates or if they're going to tighten rates. And what you see here is what they broadcast to us. They let us know. You go to their website and pull this information up. Th these dots represent each of the participants in the Federal Open Market Committee, the committee that sets these rates in the Fed, on where they think this rate is going to be at the end of each of those years along the x-axis. And the dark line, the dark blue line, is the median of these dots on that page. And the red line, or it's actually an orange line to the, to the left of it, is where the median was back in December, and then the line to the left of that, a purplish line, is the median of where these dots were back in September. And you can see here that as time has moved forward, the Fed has pushed back and pushed back and pushed back the timing of when they're going to raise rates. And that's simply because of those factors that I mentioned. Low inflation, growth is sideways, uh, and, and, and an uncertainty about where unemployment will be. Um, interesting note this morning as I was driving in, I, I heard the news that the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, actually approached the Fed and asked them to wait until 2016 to tighten rates uh, because that factors in to what's happening in Europe as well. Let me pause there. That's the portfolio. The, the next tab, we're going to enter the investment policy statement, but before I proceed, uh, are there any questions that I may answer on your behalf? Are there any questions? Is there any public comment? All right. Then let's proceed with the um, investment policy. Very good. If you look at page number 19, uh, I'd just like to remind you of the objectives of the investment policy statement. Those are the objectives per the policy, and those are the objectives that are stated by code. And I'm sorry, the, the books may say 17. Your, your slide up there says 19, so I'm, I'm not sure which, which one to use. I apologize, Randy. <laughs> Thank you. So, so do remember that the, that, that the objectives are, are actually stated by code, and they're stated in order. They require these funds to be safe, and they require these funds to be liquid enough to be able to meet your obligations. And then lastly, they require you to generate some sort of competitive yield or return in the, in, in the investment markets. And your policy has not changed. It continues to meet those goals, it continues to list those goals as their top priorities. Um, I'm going to go over a big change in California government code, which was the, the addition of supranationals. We'll discuss that in just a second. I've got a couple slides on that. And then I just want to affirm, reaffirm to you that the way that the policy is currently written as it stands does continue to meet your goals of safety, liquidity, and yield or return. And the changes that occurred in code this year do not require you to change the investment policy statement. However, there is that change that we want you to understand, and we are recommending that you review it and perhaps adopt it, because we believe that it's, it, it will add value over the long-term period. So if we turn to the next page, um, the, the addition was the addition of supranational in, uh, investments. These are bonds from supranational entities. What is a supranational? These are multilateral, multination international financial institutions. You, you've probably heard the term World Bank. This is what we're talking about, okay? Um, you have a, a number of nations that come together to form one of these. They've been around for a long time, and they contribute capital, and they participate in the management of these entities. Uh, these entities have been formed to provide uh, economic uh, redevelopment on a global basis to different parts of the world. Uh, generally, the funds that, that they generate from, from their borrowing activities are used to improve infrastructure. They can be used for environmental protection. There's some poverty reduction programs, and we're seeing a lot more renewable energy uh, projects that they do. So the way that it works is that all these nations own a piece of, of the organization. The organization issues bonds, and those bonds are full faith and credit of all the member nations within that group, including the United States, which, are, which are, is one of the main driver nations of these securities. Now, these do exhibit very high credit quality because of that multinational ownership. In the case of the United States, these are full faith and credit of the United States government, just like a treasury would be, along with all the other member nations. They've been around for a long time. They're very successful at operating. Um, the, the, their, the, the capital that they deal with comes from diverse resources. Uh, they've been known for running conservative lending practices and programs. And like I mentioned earlier, they do have strong supervision. The change, if you go to the next page, was that 
California government code this past January allowed local governments in the state of California to invest in these. Now, these have been allowed uh, in California only for the state pool, for LAFE. And LAFE has been invested in these for a long time. They do purchase these regularly. Um, the code allowed uh, only three of them. There are several, but they only allow three. They are uh, the World Bank, uh, which is known as the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, excuse me, the Inter uh, International Finance Corporation. They allow uh, that one IFC. Uh, they allow the World, uh, uh, the Inter-American Bank, and they, and they also allow, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed these up. It's World Bank, IFC, and uh, IAD. So World Bank, International Finance Corporation, and Inter-American Development, only these three. Uh, these three, you can only buy the, their bonds that are dollar denominated. These three organizations are headquartered in Washington, D.C. You can only buy their senior obligations. Uh, they have to be double A rated per code. These three are currently rated triple A. And code will allow you to purchase up to 30%. If you look at the next page, you'll see a breakdown of the three that I'm talking about. As I mentioned, there are others listed in the gray at the bottom of the page. You are not allowed to purchase those. The three are AAA rated. They're all based out of Washington, D.C. You can see the percentage that the United States is a shareholder. It is one of the top shareholders, and you can see their missions. What, why are we recommending these to you? Uh, the, the main reason is that we're really looking for ways to diversify this portfolio. Let's talk about federal agencies, which is a mainstay of any local government investment portfolio. I'm talking about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds. As the government continues its wind down of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the supply of federal agency bonds has diminished, making them very expensive. That's why you see so many treasuries in the portfolio, because sometimes we'd rather have the treasury. But more importantly, as that supply diminishes, there will come a point where that will be a sector that will be – there won't be that much supply for you to be able to – purchase bonds to diversify your portfolio. So we're looking for other alternatives. And in fact, this law, the law that changed in January, was driven by the California Association of County Treasure Tax Collectors because they face the same issue as you do. They're looking for places to invest. They're looking for ways to diversify the portfolio. And this is not a, a silver bullet answer to replace federal agencies. Their yields are comparable to agencies. Their supply is smaller. But it does give us an opportunity to be able to diversify the portfolio in a way that we've deemed appropriate and prudent. Let me stop there and take any questions you may have. Are there questions? Okay. So I, on the, the prior page, as long as I understood the right-hand column, so that is the total amount of bonds that these agencies have outstanding. Th that is correct. And, of course, that's dynamic. But that was a measure as of the beginning of last and year. How would that compare with the federal agencies when we were buying? The federal them? agencies would dwarf that. Yeah, okay. I mean, it struck me these are pretty small. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Ogerich. Um First of all, I appreciate the, the work that you do for the agency. Um, Thank you. You know, the, the issue here is whether or not we want to add supranationals. My answer is no. Um, these are, these are political organizations. Um, some of the world's um, largest protests are against one of these organizations. You know, our taxpayer dollars, we, we invest in, in treasuries. We invest in things that are, that are, that are largely U.S.-based. Um, this is one of these Swiss chocolate kind of uh, things, if you were around um, when I used that term, when we were sending checks to Switzerland um, for our reinsurance on one of our uh, – our swap. Uh, we should stay away from these. They're allowed. Um, and, you know, the, the rate of return looks attractive. Why? Because it's got a higher risk. Yeah, it's got a, it's got a good rating. Um, I, we should just stay out of these. This is just a political arena that we should not be part of. I'd rather look our taxpayers in the face and say, you know what, we invested in the corporate. It's Wells Fargo Bank. Um, I just think our focus, selfishly, this is Contra Costa County, we're not a global organization. We're using our taxpayer dollars. They ought to be investments that directly relate to us. While these the causes may be great, I just don't think we should add these to our policy at all. There's no reason. State code allows it. Um, 
and if, you know, uh, a year from now, two years from now, we have some change. I just, you know, it's not worth us doing this and, one, drawing in criticism for doing that. And, two, I just think selfishly we shouldn't be doing investing in those things. Are there other comments? Mr. Carl. And staff recommendation is that you uh, move the investment policy with the addition of the supernationals, which are U.S. domiciled institutions. So I'd make a motion that we actually. Um, I think we should about one to speak. Okay. I'll. Yeah, the motion I was going to make is that we'd move it but not add the supernationals to the policy and appreciate the input and, you know, let's have a look and see policy for the next year. Okay, it's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? So um, I had a question. So how would you compare the current returns on the supranationals with the other investments we already used? They're going to yield lower than what your corporate holdings have. They're going to be comparable to your federal agency holdings. Sometimes they trade through treasuries because of their AAA rating, meaning their yield is a little bit lower. Um, but generally, they're in par with federal agency securities in terms of the yield offered. Um, and, and like I said, uh, nothing changed in the code that requires you to adopt these. We just want to make sure that we put them in front of you right. for okay. you to weigh. And it sounds like we still have some room in our current portfolio to increase the percentage of corporate notes if you find appropriate investments that meet our return requirements? We do, Commissioner, on a limited basis. You have a requirement in your investment policy statement that every security in the portfolio must have at least uh, a double-A rating by at least one of the right. rating agencies, and that does limit the field. Right. And, and in addition, we can only invest 30 percent of our total portfolio in the field. Right now, we're at 24. So. That's correct. Okay. Um, Commissioner Taylor, while you were out, there is a motion made to um, adopt the policy but without including supranationals as an investment choice. Um, staff recommendation is to include them. So uh, do you have any comments before we vote? By, so Commissioner Arnrich made the motion. Commissioner, but – Right, not, not to accept the recommendation to – Correct. Only that portion. Only that portion. Otherwise, we're accepting the policy. And, and the rationale is that, um, you know, these are political organizations. Volatile. Vo potentially volatile. It's not clear they've actually historically been that volatile in terms of these returns. In terms of their, their returns and their bonds that they issue, no, not a lot of volatility. But I'm right. speaking to market forces. I'm speaking to what, what we've seen in the market and what they offer and their credit quality. That has not been volatile. Right. And, you know, to the extent we ever invest in LAIF, we're already invested in them. Okay. So we, we get to participate anyway. Um, Commissioner Pierce. Yeah. I'm going to agree with, with Newell on this for now. Um, I don't see them as being quite as political as he does. But on the other hand, we've got some time. So if we're on a year-to-year -year basis, let's, let's just keep an eye on it. And if we get to a point where Freddie Mae and all of that are uh, – the, the federals are not available anymore and it's all wound down and there's nothing left to invest in, then we'll have to look again. But right now, I think we're as, – as John says, we're already there with Leif. So is there any public comment? Okay, um, so all those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So it's unanimous. And so this will go to the authority with the staff recommendation to approve and the committee recommendation to approve without the inclusion of supranationals. Uh, right. I'll just go forward with the APC recommendation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, the Commissioner. time and effort. Thank you. That brings us to item 16, which is – um, relates to the I-680 State Route 4 interchange improvements and an authorization to execute an amendment to a cooperative agreement with Caltrans for right-of-way acquisition support, et cetera. Ms. Miller. Good morning, Commissioner. Susan Miller, Director of Projects. The item before you is for the I-680 SR4 interchange project phase three. As a reminder, the reconstruction of the entire interchange 684 consists of five phases. Phase three would widen Highway 4 from 
four to six lanes um, in both directions, roughly from Morello Avenue and Martinez to just past 242 in Concord. There are about nine structures within the project limits in the combined eastbound and westbound directions, which were evaluated for the widening. As the design proceeded, significant issues became evident with the initial proposed widening of structures over Grayson Creek. Grayson Creek is just east of the main interchange at 680. It was determined that due to the condition of those existing structures and the inability of the existing structure to pass the 100-year flood, that those structures must be um, replaced um, in lieu of widened. And so that was not within the, the original budget that we had assessed. Replacement of the structures, in addition, uh, requires the relocation of numerous utilities that were also not originally envisioned. <coughs> the replacements of these utilities is quite complicated in that we have to um, jack and bore them under the creek. So you need very um, significant large bore pits on either side of the creek, so they're fairly expensive relocations. The replacement also requires that we raise the profile of Highway 4 in the vicinity of Grayson Creek because now you have a, a wider structure, a longer structure, a deeper structure, and higher to pass the 100-year flood. So you have an elevation shift which raises a fair amount of Highway 4 on either side in order to accomplish this. So the originally all this has contributed to vastly increasing um, the cost of the project. The originally scoped project was approximately um, um, construction and soft costs about 58.3 million. So now the new proposed most current um, cost with this replacement of Grayson Creek is, approx is approximately 96.6 million. So an increase of about 38.3 million dollars. So we ha are now facing a significant shortfall for construction. A letter was signed by Chair Pierce and sent out to Malcolm Daughtery, Caltrans director, requesting shop funds to cover the Grayson Creek Bridge replacement. It's our stance that this is the responsibility of Caltrans because of the condition of the existing structures. <coughs> so we will need to evaluate options for the project if funding is not forthcoming. However, it is prudent to continue the right-of-way and utility work. Um, it often proves to have a much more lengthy timeline to acquire right-of-way and also to relocate utilities. In fact, that's often um, longer than actually accomplishing the design and getting that approved through Caltrans. The right-of-way is itself is largely within Caltrans right-of-way. Um, we do have overcrossings where you have requirements if we're crossing a, a city street, such as in Concord, or another jurisdiction, um, such as uh, flood control. So we'll need to get some right-of-way acquisition for that. So because of that, because largely the wider way requirements are um, within four Caltrans structures, we actually have partnered with Caltrans under this co-op, and we've in, in effect hired Caltrans to do the right-of-way acquisition and the utility coordination work. And um, they have often have blanket agreements with utility companies, which we can put into effect. Um, in this case, I'm not so sure that's going to apply for the particular utilities. So um, because of this increase in the right-of-way work, um, um, somewhat because of the flood control influence now over Grayson Creek, but more, more um, the brunt of the cost in this particular increase is due to the utility relocations, and that's why we're, request, we're requesting to amend the co-op agreement with Caltrans. So the item seeks authorization um, to amend the cooperative agreement with Caltrans by $6,463,000 for a new total agreement value of $6,930,000. The majority, as I said, of this is due to relocation work required for the Grayson Creek replacement of those bridges. Staff also requests authorization for the executive director to make any non-substantive changes to the amendment language. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Are there questions? Uh, I, I support the idea. Just a question on the funding source. Are we still within the original project parameters? Or, or it's more money than we thought, but where is this money coming from? Which pot? Is it taking away from another project? Um, well, this we have, we currently have um, measure, measure J, we have actually measure C money. <laughs> We have Measure C money and um, some J money, and we have STIP funds. We're not using the STIP funds yet. So okay. that's where the funding is coming from. 
for the, the increase in costs for pursuing shop funding. We're also going to be looking for other funding sources to fill this gap, if you will. Okay. But this current increase is coming out of measure. Great. I, I'd move the item. Commissioner Pierce? Yeah, um, I will second it with, with the caveat that this is an item that Central County has been hoping for for about 20 years, the, the condition of that entire stretch, the whole 684 rebuild. This is the first phase of getting that done. The whole issue over Grayson Creek is distressing, annoying, aggravating, because this is a, a bridge that is Caltrans's responsibility. Even if we did nothing to Highway 4 in that area, they would have to replace this bridge. They would have to make all these changes. They would have to relocate all of this. And for us to have to pay for any of it is irritating. But for them to stonewall us, I understand they're short of money too, but it, it's irritating. So um, I've talked with um, Commissioner um, Worth about this, and we are through staff working with uh, MTC to hopefully get some funds to help us with this, but we're also going to prevail upon Caltrans to assume some of the cost, at least, for the replacement of this bridge. So, 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 so. looking ahead, if we're now replacing a bridge as opposed to expanding it and we're replacing it above the existing bridge, what's the construction process going to be like? Well, uh, um, yeah, we'll be staged half at a time. That's okay. often how we. It'll be a do mess for a while. Um, the the new bit bridge actually. Um, will be wider in that it will accommodate the future phases, but it also helps us with staging. Right. So okay. there's two um, smaller structures, eastbound, westbound, and we're going to replace it with a single wider structure, which will help us with the staging, um, and then it will also accommodate the future phases. Right. So that's another reason we hit, you know, some of these utilities. But um, for, from that perspective, it helps us a lot. And plus, you only want to go through getting your permits and crossing that creek. Right. One <laughs> so there's a, a motion by Commissioner Arnrich, second by Commissioner Pierce, to approve the request. Is there any further discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Which brings us to item 17, which has two parts. This is the State Route 4, State Route 160 connector ramps, uh, both issues with um, construction management and with Union Pacific. Mm -hmm. Uh, good morning, Welcome. Chair Tatsun, and good morning, Commissioners. Ivan Ramirez, CCTA staff. And uh, the first item is actually uh, an action item, and it's got two parts to it. The first one is uh, a request to reallocate construction allocation for the State Route 4, State Route 160 connector ramps construction project. We want to reduce the allotment by $919,000. And if you approve that, we are going to uh, use that money for the second part of the action item, which is approval of a member number three for AECOM, who is providing the construction management services. And uh, the remainder of the uh, amendment amount, which is $1.8 million, would come from the reserves that we currently have on the contract. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the project was awarded to RGW Construction at the board meeting of uh, December 18, 2013. Uh, first working day was March 24, 2014. And at that time, the expected completion date was September 17, 2015. So due to two reasons in particular, the, ex the uh, completion date has been extended through early 2016. Uh, number one is that we have had some weather days, and when we award weather dates is not just the actual event, but if the conditions that are created by the event are such that if there's some muddy and the equipment cannot move forward, back and forward efficiently, or they cannot move at all in the mud, and that's particularly true with this project because we have a lot of fill that we have to bring into the project, those days are given to them. And in addition to that, we have had some issues with the uh, Union Pacific Railroad. We, per agreement, we have to give them the false work. False work are the temporary support that you have made of wood, uh, timber and steel while you build a permanent bridge. And it, in fact, whenever, they, so they get to approve that. And uh, they agreed to do it within four weeks, but we found out uh, during the process that they took as much as 11 weeks. 
So for those two reasons is that now we're going to have to ask the CM firm to be out there longer than we anticipated. And we, we want to make sure that we definitely have a minimum level of effort. You know, we have commitments to Caltrans, how much effort we need to put, source inspection, and so on. Um, uh, the other part as to why the contract amount is being exceeded is because we, we have had several challenges. One of them is uh, birds. Birds are nesting in the project. They have nested on the false work. And uh, we have had to engage the permitting agencies, and they allow us to reduce the buffer. We're supposed to create a buffer for the birds, but they are they are actually very very they have been very accommodating with us working with Caltrans to reduce that buffer and allow us to continue working. But part of what they ask us to do is to have a full time biologist in in any operation. And at one time we had two different birds in two different locations that we needed two different biologists. And if you were working at night, then you needed biologists at night. And in one time where they allow us to decrease the buffer and we were putting steel and we were getting ready for the pour, we told them, by the way, you know, we're going to be pouring concrete now. And they actually made us bring a uh, mock, pour. they actually made us make a mock pour. We bought the pump, bought the concrete truck, and we actually pumped some concrete so that we, you know, imitate the conditions that we we're going to eventually encounter. So uh, the, the alternative to that, of course, is to have the contract to stop, and, and we definitely want to do that. And uh, another reason why this has been, <laughs> the budget has been exceeded significantly is because when the contract started, the primary work at that time was being done by uh, a subcontractor, Malcolm Drilling, and uh, they came in, they mobilized, did a lot of work. Uh, when we had the groundbreaking, there was those tall cranes and all the steel. They completed the work, no problem, on schedule, but when it was the prime's time to come in and do the work, they, they basically were not ready for it. So uh, we had a, a lag on the amount of activity. Eventually, when they did mobilize, they mobilized in force, and they had to restage the work so that some of the work that was supposed to be occurring one after the other was being done concurrent. It was being done on extended ships, and it was being done on weekends because that's the only way they were going to make the time up. So the contract, fortunately for us, the contract was, has made up the time, but going forward, we still see them working extended shifts and weekends to complete the work in time. There's, there's other reasons why I don't want to take too much of your time. I can give you more details if you want, but uh, those are the reasons why uh, we are asking for this increase in the total value of the CM contract. And, and again, we're asking for reallocation of the budget and using that amount for uh, the reallocation of the construction budget allotment so that we can use it in the CM contract. So with that, I'm uh, happy to answer questions. So, so what responsibility, if any, does the contractor have for some of these costs? Well, at this point, they, they don't have any because the contractor they, they, can, they have a time in which they have to complete the work. So if at the beginning they s slow down and then they accelerate as much as they can later on, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not really uh, causing us any impact. The impact that is causing us is related to the weather and related to the railroad. Those are the reasons why the contract's been extended, not because of the contract. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Butt and Commissioner Pierce. Well, I think following up on your question, I'm reading the AECOM letter here, and it talks about uh, contract specifications weren't adequate. Um, uh, RGW Construction has had a high rate of turnover on the project, which contributed to their inability to mitigate delays effectively. RGW is on their third project manager and third field superintendent. And then, you know, in the introduction to this, I guess it talks about, it talks about the construction costs being reduced by nearly a million dollars and the CM's fee going up by nearly two million dollars. Um, and I, I guess you have it, you know, you've got a summary here of, uh, let's see, this is on page 17.1-11, uh, you have a summary of the amendments 
but I, I assume you've got a more detailed breakdown of proposed amendment number three based on hours and fees and scope and that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do have that. And, and, and we went over it in detail. And again, we, we have to keep a minimum level of effort. So does that answer your question? You have another question? Sorry. Well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just skeptical. I, I don't like CMs. You know, I think they're, I think they're underworked and overpaid. But that's just personal thing. <laughs> Commissioner Pierce. Yeah, I had, the, I had the same questions as as Tom did about uh, including reading through the letter, um, but. What I think I'm hearing you say is that the sub was on site, ready to go, geared up, mobilized, and then we had the rain delays and we had other things come in, and so that threw everybody off schedule. Is that what you said? No, sorry. What, what I meant no. to say is that when, when the project kicked off yeah. at the very beginning, most the primary work had to do with foundations, getting off the ground. So remember we had this 13-foot diameter piles that were 100 mm -hmm. feet long on the ground. Uh, that work was performed by the sub, Malcolm Drilling. So they performed their well, their, their project, I mean their piece of the work well. When they pulled out and it was time for the contractor to come in, the prime contractor to come in and begin doing their work, then they were not ready to perform that work. Now. You know, reading through the letter, you, they, they might, they, there's a very strong possibility that it had to do with all the management that changes that they had, because they had, like stated in the letter, three different project managers. But that's not our fault. It's not our fault. It should not be our dime, I would think. Well, again, I guess let, that's my question. I think that's what Tom was asking, too. I mean, it strikes me the complication here is that both the con construction manager and the contractor look to us. And so, you know, what, I think what you're telling us is the construction manager, the construction firm, the prime, wasn't as well organized as we had hoped they would have been. That's right. And, and it caused a del it, it caused changes in the anticipated work plan for the construction manager, but somehow we're left to pay for that, which is not a good feeling. We, we are left to pay with that because the contractors making up their time by working overtime extend the shifts and during the weekend. So, you, so, so there's not a lot of work happening in the middle of the project after the sub left. When they do mobilize, they mobilize in full force, right? So let me give an example. Originally their baseline schedule, they were supposed to build, there's three bridges out there. They were supposed to be uh, building two at the same time. Once the material for the force work was removed from that, they were gonna move that over to the third bridge. Well, that's not what we have going on right now. Right now we have the th – they actually went and bought additional materials for the force work and they mobilized additional crews. So now they're working on the three bridges at the same time. So that, what that does is it stretches our CM effort when they're actually working. And, and, and keep in mind that when they were slowing down and they were trying management – uh, problems. They never told us we're going to stand down and, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll call you when we're ready. That's not what they said. And there was still some work going on. Right. So recognizing that at one level it's a good thing that the prime contractor is now trying to move faster and meet the deadline so that people get to enjoy the project on time or as close to it as possible. What have we learned from this process that we can use in future projects? Can I say something, Ivan? Sure, sure. Let, let me add something to this because the issue initially was the sub went in and built the foundations on schedule. The contractor initially talked to us about the fact that they didn't have enough steel. And when I say steel, I mean the steel necessary to support, they call it false work. So it's got steel rods that hold up the, the timber that builds the forms. And they knew that up front. And so they had an issue. They, the contractor then mobilized their efforts to try to catch up because it at the end of the day, they don't want to have any liquidated damages. That's on the end of the schedule. So if they're delayed by causes that they caused, then we're going to assert liquidated damages. The piece is what's happening is they're working hard to try to catch up. And so you have to staff the inspection work. You can't – it would be ill-advised not to have anybody out there. 
The other piece is, you know, it was mentioned, it wasn't mentioned here, but, you know, Caltrans is trying to figure out what their oversight roles are. And so the, the, their oversight engineers out there re, redoing design that's costing us time and money as well. And so there are factors that, and this is, this is inherent with the risk of doing AAA. And we, we talked about this up front. There's, there's things that, that go on out in construction that we have no control over that we may have to pay in the future, but we're in control. And he's trying to mitigate these issues. He's on top of these issues. It's just that our, our um, consulting firm, when, when you tell them it's going to take 168 days, they know Jason, Jason Tom's here. He knows from AECOM. He used to work with me at Caltrans. He knows approximately what the budget's going to take to do that work, and they put a contingency in. They don't expect delays due to rain. So one of the issues was when it rained, they were going to redesign that false work so it didn't skid down the hill because they assumed they were going to get in and get out before the rain. So, so all these factors occur in the background. They try to manage the contractors' activities. They can't tell the contractor how to proceed. Otherwise, you're going to pay more. We're going to pay more, right, because we're – affecting the means and methods. What we do is try to adapt to how the contractor is trying to catch up. And that's what's happening today. So there's 24-7 there's, there's Are they six days a week? Six days a week. No, they're not 12 hours? They have, they have 10, 12 hours. Yeah. Sometimes you can only work so long, and then you have to bring another shift. No, well, I know, but we have to we have yeah. to. We sh we should be there. That's our that's our role when we triple A these so, projects. I, I, can I can I make one, one more point here? Uh, you know, we have had several challenges out there, technical birds, so on. And you know, it, we, we the only delays that are attributed to us are related to the weather, which we can control, and the railroad, which we we, we can't control. <laughs> so in spite of everything that's been going on out there, and some of that work is challenging, uh, and and it's compounded by other factors like like. Very, very strong oversight by Caltrans that we're not used to. And one of the designers is from Canada, and even though he can interpret our codes, the, the way he lays out his rebar and where it can be cut and not cut and keeping in, in, into account where the pre-stress docks go, he, he basically didn't do that in conformance with the practices that we do here, so we had to mitigate a lot of that. So there's been an ongoing, ongoing issues that we have addressed. And again, I, I cannot highlight this enough. We, the only delays that we currently have are attributed to weather and attributed to the railroad, which we can't control. Okay. And, and I'm just saying let's use this as a learning opportunity. You know, we, we've – this is sort of a new wrinkle for us in how we manage construction. What can we learn for it, from it for the next time? I understand we are where we are. People are working hard to try and make this work. Um, that's to see how – Another time, what can we learn from it? Okay. Commissioner Taylor and then Commissioner yeah. Arnold. Two questions. When I when I first read this, I would it seemed like to me there were many factors involved. Good golly. It just compiled on top and I really got out of text. When the railroad I didn't understand what a flagger was. Then I didn't understand a half a million dollars for a flagger for a train that's not there. That really, well, I know it's a railroad, but is that a true figure? Is that really going to be, is that an estimate? Or if that's the case, I, I want to ride that train. Um, you want the flagger's job. I want the flagger's job. Um, but is that a true estimate, and is that, Employee, railroad employee, or is that sub? Well, well I, it, I, I, I'm, I'm just because of the of the whole system, and I understand. And this isn't against you; it is the railroad. But I was just curious: is that a true figure? And anyway, you heard my frustration it, on that. It, it, Half it, a million dollars for a, it's like the government's trained in nowhere. Yeah. So, so it is an estimate because we don't know exactly when the project is going to complete, and we don't know exactly how much of that contractor's effort is going to be spent, you know, in, within the uh, railroad right away. Well, explain to me, what is a flagger? So no, normally what happens when you have a, a track and there's trains that are coming by, you have a flagger that's watching where the railroads are coming. It has communication with them. So in, in the old days, when I used to work in San Francisco and, uh, and we were working in the uh, Caltrain tracks, you know, you know we, they would train us and say when the 
flagger blows the horn, everybody gets off the tracks. You get away to a certain distance, and when he blows it again, then you guys, you guys can come back and work. So that's the purpose of a flagger is to provide safety for the trains and, and the travelers in the train and also for the workers. Make sure that we're out of the way when the train is coming. In, in our case, and, and this is where it gets very frustrating, is that that railroad line in which we're working doesn't have any traffic. So we haven't had a single train go by. The only thing that's gone by there is a, you know how they have those pickup trucks that they ride on the street, but then when they get on the railroad track, they put right. the, yeah. the wheels yeah. for the tracks, and they, they, that's the only thing we've seen out there. And, you know, it, it's a very difficult issue for us because we have pushed that issue. And just like we have pushed the issue with the time that it takes to review the false road drawings, which is delaying us. But, you know, the, the, the railroad, they got all the power in this situation. Oh, I, I know. And, and uh, you know, so so we so le that's that's the next item, by the way. We can oh. talk about it now if you want. But the the we first and foremost we underestimated the number of days that we were going to use the the flagger. It was at, we established it at 120 early on. I, I don't know where that number came from. We're now estimating that it's going to be 380 days. I mean not not 380, 320 or so. And again, compounding the problem here is that now the contractors working weekends and they're working extended shifts. So if we're working with these extended shifts within the within their uh, right of way or near the right of way, when, you know, if you up high and something falls can go onto the track, you know, it's, the, he needs to be there. The flagger does. So, um, so we're paying the flagger overtime. So we so we're paying his overtime, and and depending where they pull these flaggers from, we might have to pay his uh, travel to get here. Sure. Right. So, but yeah, but you know. Another thing that, that can, you know, there's a way that you can tell, you can try to minimize the cost, but it's very risky. So you have a flagger out there, and you, you tell them it's Monday, and you say, well, I'm not going to need you Tuesday and Wednesday, but I need you Thursday. Well, the red, the red will tell you, well, if he goes, he might not come back. So we, we are not willing to take that risk and delay the contract. So what we have to do in those instances is, Keep them around so when we need them on Thursday, we're not going to impact the contract's operations. What a job. Uh, so this is the one I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, this is like a story that you write a book about. Um, and as um, Chair Tastin said, there's a lot of lessons learned here. Um, it doesn't look good in any face. Um, contract's probably going to be done in time. We're here. Yeah, we're triple a a project. We spent three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a month to do nothing, because if a if if our construction management company, their job is to help lead, you know, if they know ahead of time, that in fact they're not going to be performing work, why do they got twenty people sitting out there doing nothing? You know, they have a responsibility as a consultant to us. I happen to be in the same business. I'm not going to have people sitting out there doing nothing, you know. So we spent all of our funds on a job. And, and, you know, to listen to 42 days, you know, it's, it's 44 days of delay um, other than the railroad delays, 25 days, 42 days for rain, you know, over an 18-month period in what is unquestionably the least amount of rain we've had other than back in February a year ago. I mean, rainfall was light. I mean, everything, it just doesn't look right on the face value. But, you know, when you have, well, we had this problem, then we had this problem, then we had this problem. Um, this, this is really frustrating. It does not make us look good. It would tell me that maybe we should not be doing this because if this is what we're going to get, we don't have this on other projects. So both the CM has a lot of responsibility in this, and you're sitting in the back of the audience. I hope you hear this clearly. This is not what construction management is. This is not what it's supposed to accomplish. You're not out there babysitting. You're out there to lead identify and cause people to perform. You don't have to interfere with their construction methodology, but we sure as hell are supposed to be meeting and, and not sit around listening to somebody say, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. And, and we're here picking up 20%, 20% of the construction contact. We're paying for people to sit out there and watch this job. That's not an acceptable methodology. So lessons learned. 
how, you know, not to answer today, to go back when this job is done, what can we do differently to make sure through our contractual languages that we have in there that if the contractor is delaying through a variety of places, because I get it, as a construction manager, I say, I'm going to put 10 people on this job, and, you know, I'm not exactly going to pull them off every other week, and then I'm not going to bill you for them because, you don't, you, you know, you've got to make some commitment. But the fact is, is that we can put language in our contracts. We'll help protect us as an agency because right now it's, an, it's a blank checkbook. Contractor can do whatever he wants. Says, I'm going to worry about when I get to the end of the job. You just keep moving up and down, and you accommodate me whatever I want. I'm going to make money while you lose money. I would have rather given a couple of million dollars to the, the contractor if it motivated him to get the thing done on time. So, you know, this, this just says not one aspect of this feels good. Um, that's a comment. I'm sorry, but I really, you just, every single thing here, Bob's point on the next, I uh, just like, okay, let's rewrite our book, let's rewrite our specs, um, and create some languages or reconsider doing these jobs under this methodology. Commissioner Pierce. Well, I guess uh, one of the reasons that we entered into this to do it ourselves is because we did have control and certainly more control than if Caltrans were to build the project. And that's not to slam Caltrans, that's just to say that Caltrans does things differently and may not have the same priorities of time and, and things that, that we do. So I guess the theoretical question for us to ask is, are we still ahead of where we would have been had we asked Caltrans to build the project for us where we had no control? And I don't know the answer to that. I can guess the answer to that because our prior experience has not been wonderful um, when we've not had the control over the dollars. We've had to pay the bill, but we haven't had the control over the schedules and things like that. So. I guess I would, I would um, trust that our staff has been on top of this and, and that they will be able to tell us in future if they think there are improvements we need to make to our process. But my gut instinct tells me that we're probably still in better shape than we would have been had we turned over the control of this project to someone else. Um, this was not an urgency item for anyone but us. Um, do you want to say something else, sir? Yes, please. Commissioners, I, I, I'm not going to argue with anything that was said. It's a frustrating situation. It's a design, bid, build contract. That's what we're, we're stuck with. We don't do design, build. You know, your, your Commissioner Arnold, your experience is probably more in the vertical arena than in, in the flat, horizontal arena. And what Ivan was trying to say very nicely is there's some things that we can't overcome. I mean, we, we can't, we try to deal with the railroad. In fact, I even called our assembly member to try to get, we, we need to do something about that where you have an abandoned line or a line that has no traffic and yet we've got to go through a process of bringing somebody on board, keeping them weak, even though we only have to use them once. That's frustrating to us as well as it is to you. It's frustrating for us to even have to tell you that, but that's that's the, the, the realm of, of what we, we are dealing with. What you don't see in the background is, you know, you, you see the structure as it rises off the, off the ground. You see the faults work coming. Everything's beautiful. All those have to be fact-checked, calculated, because our CM firm is on the hook. They're, they're on the hook. So R Ross has a great saying. He says, we do about a half a billion dollars worth of construction. We hired one person, Ivan. But he manages all those contracts. He hires the best firms that we possibly can find, and then we use the tools that are available. So. We tried to pass CMGC last year. We couldn't get it through the Senate side. That, that procurement would allow for some reduction in risk. And that's really what we're talking about here today is we have no control over the weather. We, maybe we should. We have no control over the railroad. That's something that's probably more controllable than the weather. And, and I, you don't, I, I think you don't get a sense of, of the work that the CM firm does when they're, they're out there trying to deal with the fact that something isn't working quite right, and then they have to engineer a fix very, very quickly. And so I know um, Ivan has not gotten into all those headache moments where he's ranting and raving in his office with our, with our consulting firm, but 
I, I think, Com Commissioner Pierce, that we are we are in control, and you have we do have to bring these things to you every now and then because that's just the way this thing is structured. And we like to present it to you, and we like the feedback, and we will look at our specs to try to make them better. We're always working on our specs. We're always trying to make them better, and that's the next item that, that uh, Ivan is going to talk about. Um, so I, I appreciate all that. And I, I think, you know, as I've heard this, we can't do anything about the birds. We can't do anything about the weather. All that caused certain amounts of these costs. I think what I'm guessing is what, what may have affected the other commissioners and certainly did me is the period between the subcontractor who did well and the prime contractor who was slow off the mark. Um, and in terms of construction management, we didn't adjust and we didn't anticipate that. And, and I guess I would come back and say one of the things that we pride ourselves on is being the agency of choice for vendors to work with. And therefore, we should also think about how we work with the vendors of choice so that when there are these unanticipated events that we are working hand in glove not only to solve the technical problems but also to say, okay, you know, we understand, agency, you have a problem that we didn't cause, that you didn't cause, but how can we help you out? And I imagine a lot of that went on, but it's in terms of the delay between the subcontractor and the prime contractor doing their part of the work, that part of the cooperation is not evident from today's discussion. So um, <laughs> may I make a few comments? First and foremost, sure. th thank you for uh, offering those comments. I, I share your frustration when this came, uh, came to me. I, I felt the same way you do at, the, at, at this point. Uh, the, the, there's, there's two things that I want to point out to you. Uh, the first one is that I, I went back at that time on the hours that were charged, and there, there, there could have been, there, yeah, there could have been some opportunities in my mind where the CM firm could have done a better job uh, mitigating the staffing out there, the, the level that it was costing us. But I want to reassure you that that's not where the costs for this are coming from. That, that would have been, that would, there's a cost in there, but it, it wouldn't have been that significant to perhaps lower it two percentage points, like, like probably uh, even, even, at, even at that level is not good enough. Um, the, the second thing I want to tell you is that we have a new person helping me manage this contract, and his name is Chris Cole, right here with the blue shirt. He is a, a, he's a very experienced construction person that we hire. So if there's a lesson here, maybe that's one that you're looking for. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and does Chris work for the authority or for the construction manager he, he, firm? He works for Stantic, who is a new he, – he's a okay. sub-consultant to Stantic. Okay. All right. So he, uh, he came in, uh, and uh, very quickly he started talking the language that we like to talk. So I'm very optimistic that he's going to be able to manage this contract going forward in the best possible manner because, I, again, I, I, I cannot reiterate how – Strongly, I feel about this the same way you do. I, I would move 17-1. Yeah, I'm going to second. I just want to make one last comment that, uh, uh, you know, as we say to beat a dead horse, uh, we spent – this is the part that really hurts. We spent 100 percent of our CM fee to do 55 percent of the work. Um, so that was uh, $5.8 million. To do the last 45 percent, we're going to spend $1.8 million, just face value. And we're talking about all this overtime. That math doesn't even add up on that face value. Something isn't right in all of that because it's not here. So again, um, uh, we'll move on and hope to see some um, creative ideas and all of you speaking the same language and how we can try to avoid this in the future. There's a motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Arnrich. Any further comment? All those, and this is to approve staff recommendation on item 17-1. Um, and I assume that the report to the authority will include a brief summary of the discussion we've had <laughs> this morning. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And Commissioner Butt is absent. Which brings us to 17-2. Yes, uh, Commissioner. I would move the item. We don't have a choice. No. 
No, actually, here's a, this is a this is an idea. If it's if it really is a, a line that doesn't have it, can we pay um, because it, it would give us put in permanent or semi permanent um, um, train stops to barricade this off as opposed to paying a guy? I'd rather pay to have some steel and concrete out there than have a guy stand there with a flag and do nothing. I would just tell you our experience when we've been looking at this for other reasons is that UP is purposely holding that line as an act line because it goes all the way around to the Oakland port right. and so they want it legally active and they will not change it absolutely will not change have it we, have the we, whole highway four thing we tried to so get them have, to deactivate. My question was to Randy. Yeah. Randy have we asked them whether or not we can do temporary train barricades at either end of our construction zone for the period of time of this for our cost, what would it cost, and remove them at the end of this, which provides the protection. And the we can we can ask that, but they deem it an active line. That's why they have a flag around. Once they, you know, get rid of it. Otherwise, Bart East County would have gone down the Makoko line a lot cheaper, and we wouldn't have even yeah, been right. involved. Right. We'll check. We'll check on that. Thanks. Sure. All right. There is a motion. I'm not sure there's been a second. Okay, uh, motion by Commissioner Pierce, second by Commissioner Arnerich to approve the staff recommendation for item 17.2. All those, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yes. <laughs> Which then brings us to item 18, the approval to adopt and updated procedures for 30 advertised projects. Is, uh, Mr. Ramirez, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel welcome. I feel welcome. So. Uh, so uh, this is an actual, uh, also an action item, and uh, we're asking uh, the board approve resolution 1538B, where we adopt the 2015 construction management guide as our procedures uh, to administer construction progress uh, contracts. And, and what we try to do here is to memorialize our, our procedures from advertisement all the way to project completion. When when Caltrans does the work for us, they, they have their uh, relationships with the Water Board, with the Department of Industrial Relations, and so on. And, and uh, when when Cal EPA, and uh, when uh, we are administering these contracts, we have to establish our own relationships with them because we're responsible for the construction site. So we try to memorialize that in there, and uh, we also give guides to um, our CM firms contractors and anybody in staff, hopefully the commissioners, as to how we perform the work. And uh, so this is one of the first tasks that Ross Chittenden, the Deputy Executive Director for Projects, asked me to do when I first got hired. He came to my office, he handed me the old one, he gave me the new one. So it's been ready for about a year, but as things come up and we learn, we try to tweak it, but the time comes we really have to bring it to you for approval. And that's the reason why we're asking for the Executive Director to make changes as needed because we are we are going to find new things and things are going to change and we want to be able to put them in there and maybe on a yearly basis we can bring it back to you for approval. Commissioner Taylor, second by Commissioner Arnish to approve resolution 1538-P and forward to the authority. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor please say aye. Aye. It's unanimous with Commissioner Butt being absent. Aren't you, aren't you glad you came to, came to, uh, yeah, aren't you glad you're here this morning? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing thank, well. you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, all right. In terms of chair's comments, just to note that the uh, San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority approved the interagency transfer agreement for the rail line, and assuming Secretary Kelly does this by June 30th, we will take over. Um, July 1st, and there is currently funding in the budget to add another frequency to from Oakland yep. to Bakersfield. And we're obviously working on more. Uh, other commissioners' comments and activities, et cetera? Seeing none, ex executive staff comments. Thank you, Chair Katz and commissioners. I have a, one good news story. I, just, I forgot to, to talk about it at the last board meeting, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and reiterate it at the next board meeting. But I'm so excited about this. If you remember the ATP program, the Active Transportation Program, we had asked for $2 million for San, 
San Pablo Dam Road project to, because it, it's eligible, the overhead overcrossing, the pedestrian overcrossing is eligible for those kinds of money. So we asked for $2 million, and the line unfortunately went right through our project. So MTC didn't give us the dollars they gave the next, I think they had $900,000 left or $600,000 left. So they gave it to a project in Berkeley. And so I called Steve Heminger and I said, hey, you, you guys cut, cut our project. I think it was nine, it was almost a million left. And, and so we, he goes, well, when we had a million, you asked for two. And I said, well, we could have used a million. And he goes, well, what would you have done? And I said, we'd have taken a million dollars of Measure J and we put it on phase two. So we, instead of being $60 million short, would be $59 million short. So he called back and he said, hey, we're going to give you $655,000. I said, well, thanks, that's great. We appreciate that. So we moved 655000 where the number was off our project back into phase two. So now we're $59 million plus some change short. In the meantime, what's happening, a lot of the, lot of, and this is what, when you have federal money, a lot, a lot of people say, yeah, we're going to deliver it, but then they can't. They realize, oh, my God, you know, we got these permits and we can't, we won't have it right away or whatever. So we just received in Contra Costa an additional $3.674 million in ATP cycle uh, one funds. One, we got some more money for San Pablo Dam Road. We got, we got uh, $1.3 million addition to make us a total of $2 million. And then Contra Costa County got, got 800000 for Port Chicago Highway and Willow Pass Road Bike and Pedestrian Facility. And Pleasant Hill got Contra Costa Boulevard improvements, about $1.5 million. So we, we got some more dollars. So that's good partnership with our, our because somebody asked us that the other day about making money, right? How do you get the money? I said, we don't, we don't stomp on the toes of the people that allocate the dollars. We, you know, we go ahead and we kind of make our case. If we don't get the dollars, we, we move forward. Speaking of dollars, yesterday we, we kicked off the first expenditure plan advisory committee. By the way, these agendas, if you're interested, are on our website, and they're the same location where you get your, your packets for the board. So if you're interested, take a look at that. We're trying to reduce paper and the, all the EPAC that's, that's the acronym term, EPAC, that all the members said, yeah, we don't want paper. And so we'll go to that website. And so we, we hosted the first meeting yesterday. Julie kicked it off, and then she, she said that she and I weren't supposed to listen to all the comments, but I actually stayed for the whole meeting. She had another meeting to go to. We had uh, people there. Most of the attendees showed up. And the, the points that were made yesterday is, how come we don't have somebody representing agriculture? And how come we don't have somebody representing goods movement? So we suggested the California Trucking Association. Eric Sauer is a good friend of mine. He's the vice president for government affairs, so I'm going to go ahead and call him. I think Eric Zell is, is talking about the Farm Bureau getting a representative there. The question that we had last night at the, at the uh, AP, uh, PC meeting was, you know, who's going to make the decision? How do we make that decision? And I said, well, we're, we're trying to work that out. So I don't, I'm not sure – Who's going to make or how we're going to make that decision, Commissioner Pierce? I would I would just comment that that's part of what we hired our um, consultant team to do is to narrow that field, and then they will bring those names that have been added and finalized since our last authority meeting. Those names will all be brought back to the authority for okay. confirmation at the next meeting. That's the process. The EPAC members all introduced themselves and explained why they were there and what they were looking for. And then we went through the, the TEP, the tra Transportation Expenditure Plan Principles, and they said it provided a solid background. Some of the members actually got into more specificity on what they thought the language should be toward how they were being rep who they were representing. But overall, nobody got in any fist fights. I mean, it was a great, it was a great I think it was a great start to, to a, a process that, um, that we've begun, and it was mentioned about 10 times, you know, no decision has been made, no decision has been made, you know, thank you for your efforts, but no decision has been made on moving forward. We're trying to figure out what is going to be in that transportation expenditure plan. We want your input. You're representing your, your, your areas of expertise, and so it went very well. So I wanted to, to tell you that. So thank you. So I, I would just say on the ag representation, the local area information commission is – contemplating putting in place an agricultural policy to guide their decisions. And so as a result of that, we've had a lot of outreach with the agricultural community. So let me shoot you a couple of names okay. of people who could be ag representatives, because some of these organizations, while they exist in name, do not exist in practice. Commissioner Pierce? 
Yeah, I forgot when you were asking for commissioner comments. Um, we did have a luncheon that several of us attended in Sacramento with the California Transportation Foundation, gave their annual awards, and our own commissioner emeritus, Jim Frazier, now assemblyman, Jim Frazier and chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee was awarded their elected official of the year award. And so we were able to be there and and see him receive that. And he was just as tickled as he could be. So he called us out as, you know, remembering where he came from. So that's a good thing. Any other comments? And if not, we are adjourned until July 2nd at 830 here. Thank you.